All righty, bow hunters, welcome back to becoming a bow hunter. Sitting here with Cam Anderson. Cam, welcome, dude. Thank you. So, um, the Hunters Journal on Instagram. So, at the Hunters Journal uh, on that. You're, you, I mean, you've done pretty well to kind of bring a few loves together. I think in bringing your creative side into the outdoors as well. Um, and I don't know, I haven't seen that much of your content, but I mean regarding you getting out you're doing some hunting stuff i know you also do i think a little bit of snowboarding and outdoors stuff within new south oh, sorry within new zealand as well um pretty much a lot of your stuff is filming but obviously you've got the photography side as well right yeah 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 so so at the moment like most of my focus has, has been in the print side of of the hunter's journal with doing the magazine um but my background's all video so i mm -hmm. still do that to make some cash on the side yeah yeah, it's cool. And so, I mean, what does the outdoors kind of mean to you or bring to you right now? I think I think it's, a, it's an interesting time. Obviously, we're in isolation right now. We're in lockdown. Um, yeah. I think it kind of really makes you appreciate what we do have when we do get to go out and get about with um, with friends or in the outdoors or whatever it is. Like, we're obviously very restricted with what we can do right now. And I think it kind of brings to front of mind as to maybe what, what the outdoors is. So, what is it for you? Oh, shit. It's... Um... <laughs> that's probably not a not a simple question is it it's um i don't know it almost feels like everything um you know because like it's like an escape and it's like a home and you know it's it's weird you know it's almost what my life revolves around you know like a livelihood <laughs> for you now right as well yeah 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 and, and and definitely that um and that's like that's been um real realization with the with the whole lockdown is we're, we're still getting people purchasing magazines so mm -hmm. that's been paying the rent and and whatnot but um but yeah it's like being on the lockdown is like i literally can't do any work yeah. because you know because i can't get into the mountains that's that's where it all comes from <laughs> yeah yeah but, definitely and so i mean without knowing how long lockdown is for what are the kind of plans right now is it pretty much refilter any things that you've got previously or just reutilize some of the content you've previously had like what's the what's the go um, right now so it's so a lot of it's been editing um the first like couple of weeks was just like cleaning up the film and, and getting that online um and then it's also been sorting out some some of the next content for the next issue that will put out um and then just some other admin sort of stuff yeah. but um but yeah we we uh i think we'll exit level four on wednesday which is in like four or five days okay and so that means that we'll go back down to level three and so there's been a bunch of shit here where under level three they were going to let people go tramping and mountain biking but hunting was still banned right. <laughs> so everyone kicked up a, a real fuss about that which was good because um it meant that they kind of started talking about it. So mm. it's looking like we should be able to go for day hunts. Yeah. I know here in uh, Australia, I don't know if it's just Queensland based or not, but they shut down all the gun shops, which meant that uh, people couldn't get ammo anymore. Uh, so people who were yeah. doing like even just farmers getting uh, ammo for feral control, they were no longer able to do. So I signed a petition and it got more, like it got released. I knew my local gun shop actually just opened back up the other day I got an email through and there's, there's strict rules around what can happen and you have to have some licensing. You have to show some letters from, from farmers or yeah. whatever that you're going to be doing the federal control. But at least it's something like that's, that's cool to see that the word does kind of get listened to a little bit when people do speak up. So I, I saw the petition come up just by luck and signed it. And I'm uh, yeah, glad that something happened for it. Yeah. 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 That's, um, it's it because it's just, it, it's strange when, I don't know, people, there's rules set around what we do but the rules just make no sense yeah. whatsoever. You know, like it's just so frustrating. But. Some, of, some of the memes that are getting around are so classic. It's like <laughs> things we can do is like lining up in Woolworths with people all around you, yet you go out in the, in the field by yourself and that's a, that's a no-go. It's, like, it's so <laughs> stupid, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's funny that it has to be explained through memes for some people to get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. You just hope some people are up higher seeing it, hey? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But um. But yeah, so just trying to work out the next few trips because we're definitely going to do another film. Um, but this one's going to be rifle focus okay. just because um, I just want to keep mixing it up. 
um although i absolutely love filming bow hunting like <laughs> yeah it's it's definitely my favorite stuff to, to capture but um but yeah trying to line up some of that lining up a hunt with with monty i'm going to mm-hmm. try and keep up with him i'll probably just take photos for that on that trip but i'll also take a bow with me because i still haven't got an animal with it yet so yeah, yeah, yeah cool so i mean Let's do It'll a quick retrack. You're talking about Monty Nixon there, and the film you keep saying is uh, Wildfire, which is something you guys have just released on your on your website, um, which is thehuntersjournal.co.nz. Yeah. yeah, or they can just Google it. I mean, YouTube it or whatever. Yeah, so, so I actually only just watched it kind of yesterday, and it's sick, dude. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think it kind of takes a bit of a different look, like your creative spin on it. It's actually a little bit different to what you see in most hunting films, I think, so... Um, good. No, I think it was really cool, and uh, I, for the first time, I actually got to hear a seeker deer doing doing their little roars. I thought that was that was so cool to hear for the first yeah. time. Yeah, well, that, that was my first time hunting seeker, and um, it's funny because when everyone talks about New Zealand hunting, they're always talking about the tar or or the red stag. Yeah. Well, um, well, like you know, you guys got reds over there as well, but a lot of the yaks and stuff like they just love the red stag and tar. But holy shit, Seeker are probably now my favourite animal to hunt. Like, mm-hmm. they are just the most cunning, exciting animals to hunt in the bush. <laughs> they seem very secretive and very almost like skittish. Yeah, yeah, they're just like they're like ghosts in the bush. And unfortunately, um, on both those trips that we went on during that film, um, the animals weren't kind of in the full rut, so they mm-hmm. weren't they they weren't doing a lot of calls. But um. But yeah, apparently some of Khan's videos that he's got on YouTube, you can see them when they're in full rut. And yeah, they'll they'll do their single calls and you can sneak in on them or, or they'll come in on you and you just don't hear a thing. And all of a sudden they're just standing there, you know, checking you out. But yeah. yeah, can't get enough of that stuff, eh? So Khan Adams is the guy that you videoed and um, that was kind of my first introduction to him too. So I haven't actually checked out any of his stuff, which I will. But um, I, I was really surprised. It almost sounds like an eagle or something, like the way that they call that was my first thought. I was like, is that a bird in the background? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, um, it's a real unusual sound. Um, but yeah, like I said, all of it was new to me because that was my first time hunting seeker. So yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, you said just before you haven't actually taken an animal with the bow yet. Have you, you're previously a, a rifle hunter yourself. Yeah. Well, I, I don't do a lot of hunting myself. Like I've grown up a hunter and um, obviously that's how I got into, you know, making the hunter's journal was because, yeah, because I was a making hunter. But yeah, so that's all been with a rifle. Um, but then I've been on a few trips with bow hunters since I started up the journal. And um, fuck, it's just like, it's just got me hooked on it. But then obviously it was going to take some time to to save up and, and get myself a bow. Um, but then Adam and Kimmy were able to help me out. That's so... It. Yeah, so, so so since a trip with them, they sent over um, a bow that Kimmy couldn't, because uh, Kimmy was left-handed, but she got sent a right-handed bow. Ah, no way. So so I did a wee trade with them with some with some product, and then they sent me over a bow. And so for the last probably four months, I've only taken it out on like two. I've probably been stalking with it twice. Yeah, but um, I've been shooting it a ton at home and whatnot, but. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for, just to getting out on on an actual hunt that I can just focus on trying to get something with a bow. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Do you think, um, this is kind of a big question I have for you, I, I don't know how much prevalence it has, but do you think recording bow hunters has made you a better hunter all around? Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. <laughs> yeah. It's, what, um, what sort of things do you think you've learned from? Like, I mean, you've, you've filmed some pretty impressive people. Like, you've been out in some of the hunts with, um, with the green trees, like you said, um, with Pedro from, he's from Spain, isn't he? Yeah, 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 he's, um, yeah, he's a Spaniard. Yeah, and so, I mean, like, th- there's some pretty well-known hunters out there that you're, you're kind of getting out with and, and filming. I mean, even this one that you've done with, um, with Khan, like, obviously, he's a pretty keen, keen bow hunter. Is, is there kind of, like, some big insights or big takeaways that you've got from that? Yeah, definitely. Well, it's it's more, it's yeah, it's so funny because like with the rifle hunting, um, I, I still love rifle hunting and I'll probably still do more of it. Yeah. Um, but like, I, I think it was Nick Morton that put up a post about, you know, being a bow hunter. It's like less about the shooting, which you have to have on point, obviously, but it's more about 
your ability to be able to read animals mm -hmm. to, to be able to get in close for the shot. Yeah. And so, and so that's where it all comes from. Like if you've got a good animal and you're with a rifle hunter, then as soon as you're within, you know, around 300 meters then the animal's going to be dead. Yeah. Cause you're just going to sit down, line up the shot and, and take it. Meanwhile, when you're spending an extra hour or whatever it is trying to get in closer to, to the animal, you know, within, you know, 50, 40 meters, then you learn so much more about them. Mm. And so, and so that's what it's been like for me, you know, even behind the camera, because essentially you're, you're a hunter yourself when you've got the camera there. Um, so you have to participate in, in everything. Yeah. So yeah, just, yeah, just learning how to close that, that last hundred meters has been, has been big for me filming and photographing some bow hunters. Yeah, that's awesome. And have you, like, were you nervous? Well, I guess it's a nerve wracking thing, right? The fact that the stalk could potentially be blown by anything that you do, like obviously the hunter in general, but to have two of you then trying to get that close yep. as well, it just makes it double as hard essentially. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even, even with a camera, like I find, you know, on the, on the couple of hunts that I've been on with the bow in my hand instead of a camera, there's so many similarities between filming bow hunting and bow hunting yourself. Like, mm. yeah, getting in close. So, so once you've done that, then that's, that's a big step. But also executing a good shot with the camera. Yeah. It, it can be so tough. And like, and like you'll see in that wildfire, I miss a shot. Yeah. And, that was, and that was because um, I, was, I was trying to get a wee bit too creative and decided to switch cameras as soon as I spotted it. Yeah. And then on the Fuji, it's got um, locks on the button, which I always have off, but they must have clicked off in the bush. Oh, and, so, and so they had flicked on. So when, you know, brought the camera up, it was, wasn't working. And so that's just an example of, you know, like you can have an animal come in perfectly, but you can still screw up the shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting. I mean, when it comes to, to cameras, Actually, something I've noticed when I'm in the bush is that I'll, I'll often just wear a GoPro on my head. Um, and I've noticed, obviously, you get the glare from the GoPro, like from the lens, and that shines off in other directions. I actually think that's given me away at times. Um, yeah, right. Just because of the position that sits. So I think that's kind of something you have to be aware of as well, right? Yeah. Well, I, I've i never actively done anything to avoid that because you kind of can't. But there's something mm. around cameras, man, like, Sometimes it, it can spook them, and and yeah, there's there's definitely you know lens glares that come off off the cameras and 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 whatnot. Um, my my main camera that I shoot on is is pretty much just matte black, so I don't think that affects it too much apart from yeah the actual front of the lens. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, man, because like a GoPro, like you know, especially when they're in those cases, they're they're quite a glary, shiny thing. So. Yeah, yeah, I reckon I reckon that definitely could could blow something for you. Well, I think uh, like obviously if there's some water built up or something, that might create a little bit of glare. But outside of that, there's not going to be many things in the bush that create much glare for for an animal. So if they see that, they're going to be like, "What the heck is that?" Like it, it definitely made sense to me when it happened. I was like, "Ah, oh, fuck! I'm pretty sure that just ruined me." So what I've been doing or what I did with the rut just recently is um, I walked around with it flat down on the brim. And then whenever I okay. got close to, like whenever I went to film instead, I'd pop it up and then press, press record just that last little moment. So and I, I don't know, I think that's a better method, whether it's just in all in my head or not, I'm not sure. But <laughs> no, no, I reckon there's definitely something to that. But yeah, it's definitely impressive if you're still thinking about the camera. It's good. Yes. Yeah. I definitely find it hard to, to think about flicking the camera on if I was, if I was talking on an animal and in the moment. <laughs> So when, when it comes to like, obviously that side of things, cause you're, you're focusing on getting good shots. Um, like you said, you're, you're still having to work hard to make sure that the, the view and everything looks good. Like, do you think it's just kind of built up from years of doing it as a, from a creative side as to what looks good and what's going to, what's going to kind of work out from a, that like filming perspective? Yeah, definitely. And, but for, with the bow hunting, like shit, I've only filmed and photographed like, maybe around 10 bow hunting trips. So that's still, you know, bugger all. Yeah. So, so I'm still learning every time I go out filming bow hunting. Um, and so I, I want to keep doing it cause there's a lot that I could do better and I'm just pretty much figuring that out now. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the, the rest of it, it's pretty much muscle memory. Yeah. Yeah. Like once you've done enough filming, it's just, um, 
it's just you naturally record the things that you have in the past and and, and you know what's going to look good in the camera mm -hmm. and so it's just natural and it's just muscle memory to, to hit record and start getting those sort of shots yeah so yeah no that's cool and like what other outdoor filming have you done apart from hunting um oh what have i pretty much the only other stuff is like snowboarding and skiing yeah. and, and and maybe some other other commercial stuff and some like weddings and is that yeah, like yeah stationary for the snowboarding or you're actually you're moving with some dynamic stuff dynamic film yeah stuff. yeah I'll, I'll kind of do both like sometimes you might sit up on on a jump with a long lens and record them then other times i'll i'll ride down with them um as they're hitting features and whatnot so yeah it's a bit of both and 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 i loved filming snowboarding like it's it's the most it's the most fun because you're pretty much just like you go out, you, you do your thing. It's real relaxing. It's real easy. You pretty much just get on the piss every night and then you do, <laughs> you know, you just do that yeah. cycle. So, so it's heaps of fun. Um, but I've just got more of a passion for hunting. So yeah. What about you? It, you're South Island. Uh, hey, are you near Wanaka? Yeah. Oh no. So we're, we're probably like five hours North of Wanaka. Okay. So it's, so we're in Oxford, which is 40 minutes um, west of Christchurch. Yeah. So near Mount Hutt's the main one that you'd go film at, or you kind of jump down low as well? Um, no. Nah, so like usually all the snowboarding filming that I've done, I'll just go down to Wanaka for a week yeah. or something. Yeah. So That's yeah, so cool. I've just, been over there multiple so times. Like Cadrona is such a sick place to go. Even Jericho, yeah, like yeah. they're both so incredible. Yeah. So Cicardi's is where we've done most of the filming. Yeah, and then yeah, we've done some heli stuff out the back of TC and whatnot. So yeah, that's cool. It's so impressive watching what people can do, right? Like getting out on the board and just like no fear, just freaking flipping and like, it's, I don't know, it's insane. Yeah, it's wild, and and especially that big mountain stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm wanting to like I've been wanting to do it for the last couple of years. It's just real hard to line up. Is um so so Carlos, he's one of the main guys that I've that I've filmed snowboarding with. Um. Mm -hmm. I want to do a, a project with him where we do some snowboarding, some hunting in the same trip. Yeah, sick. Because because there's a lot of areas that that we can fly into where we could set up camp, you know, just within the snow line, and we can head down to hunt tar and chamois, and yeah. then we could hike up and film some snowboarding, just like kind of make a whole trip around it. Yeah. So that's the uh, yeah, that's a big thing that I want to I want to try. That's cool. Nail That'd be a good film. Yeah, it would be. So it's um, all pretty crowd pleasing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I mean, with the process of creating that film, like it's a thirty-minute film. So obviously, there's um, there's a lot that goes into that. We're talking about wildfire here. So when it goes to that, like how long, how long of it, um, like how long between did it take you to film that? Because obviously, you, you helicopter into a place, you walk into a place. Like there's a, there's a fair bit going on. How long of the spread is that over? That that whole film was probably shot around uh, over space of probably two and a half weeks okay and, and so and so that red trip that we went in on we only got i think three days in our block because there was a big weather front coming in meanwhile yeah, usually exactly. we would have got um five or six days in there yeah. so so does that mean we didn't get you know we didn't get a lot of time there and then so we flew out of that spent a few days at home um and then we flew up to the north islands and then just went straight into the Seeky country for, I think it was like six or seven days that we're in there for. Yeah. So. I mean, it, it's interesting. I was talking to this about uh, with Andre Alapate um, yeah. about the whole thing of showing an episode and obviously showing the success that you get. But like just then you talking about being there for only three days in the red, red block, it almost seemed like you guys got there and then the next morning, like you were very successful and that was it. You flew out. Like, it's hard to kind of almost picture that within the film, right? Yeah. Well, well, that that was pretty much what happened on that red trip. We did we did fly in, um, and then and then the next day we had spotted the first animal, um, you know, first couple of stags. So we just decided to make it happen then and there. And then what we didn't show was there was another day that just wasn't eventful. Like we yeah. just went for a fucking big hike, and I just didn't feel there was much. Point to actually show, yeah, exactly. It, you know, like I wanted to keep it somewhat action packed, yeah. Um, but like, what, what I definitely want to do in the future is I want to show a lot more of the adventure and a lot more of 
the person's background. So that's what we'll be doing in the next one is I want to show a lot more of like who they are, their reasons for, for hunting these animals. Like Khan Adam, he was actually brought up in the North Island and he had hunted sea since he was, you know, young and whatnot. But you don't learn anything about him in that film and that's yeah. what I want to do. Um, and this one's coming up, but yeah. No, that's cool. That's a, that's a cool idea. Um, kind of getting the, the background to it all. And I guess that's kind of one part of the podcast that I like doing as well because you do get to kind of find out what people's backgrounds are. Um, I guess into hunting a little bit, more, mm. not, not so much work aside. Um, but I mean, yeah. you, you, it's really cool because your work is obviously very related to hunting. Um, right now, is I would say like even, because when did the Hunter's Channel start? Was it last year or was it the year before you released your first volume? Uh, a year and a half year. ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, it was, yeah. We, we did a full year last year and then it was, yeah, pretty much a year and a half. So exactly. I, but, um, you... I, I, I had the dog, sorry. Oh no, go on. Sorry. Oh, like it was, it was probably about three or four years that, that I bought, um, that I bought the domain name and, and set, set everything up. Yeah. And when I was like probably, I think that was when I was like 16, 16 or 17 that I set that up. Mm -hmm. But I originally wanted to do a TV show. And yeah. this was at the same time that um, the other two TV shows started up in, in New Zealand. Um, but none of us knew each other at the time. Or none of us knew that we were wanting to do TV shows. But me being like a 17-year-old grommy, <laughs> I couldn't really get the backing for it. So yeah. I'd yeah, just kind of lay back and just did video work. And then, yeah, year and a half ago, I was like, fuck, let's get into it. Shopping the skills up. And so, I mean, obviously in this day and age, like right now, there's magazines shutting down all over the place. And it's an interesting time because pretty much everything's going online. Like you've got your social platforms where people can show their own photos, their own stories on Instagram and, and whatever else. But it, it, like, it, it seems a very interesting time. Like here in Australia, we literally just saw one of the, um, one of the two main bow hunting magazines shut down. And so it's very interesting to see like you're launching, you, you guys are just kind of yeah, getting into it. Um, where's the, the concept? Like I, I think, within saying that and looking at the quality of your magazine, being just actual, actually like the paper quality, the print quality, like that just looks incredibly different to say some of the stuff that we're seeing over here, just in any old magazine front. So what, what's kind of like the goal and what's the, um, I guess the view for what's happening with the Hunter's Journal? Yeah. Well, one thing that, that is really, really helpful is the fact that I do have that background and, and video and photo. Mm. And so I, a problem for a lot of those magazines that, that are shutting down is they can't, they can't deliver on the, on that side, which I think will be essential for us, you know, for us in the future is that if we can't, um, if we can't deliver on the social side of things, then, then we would probably die as well. Yeah. So, so we're really lucky to, to have that side of things. Um, but the other thing is, it's like, it's, it's good you, you know like if you've got a magazine you haven't changed it for the last 20 years it's going to get boring and like why would people still be picking it up yeah and so that's why we wanted to, to come into this was just something totally fresh and new otherwise there wouldn't be any point in it yeah. um and then also hunting hunting is something that i don't think can be entirely told or enjoyed over social media no because you know you, you you'll get a picture of something um and you'll get like a wee blurb about it underneath, but there's there's not a lot in there. Mm. Like it's cool, you know, it's it's cool to flick over and be able to go on your phone and 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 see what people are up to and whatnot. But I've just found that hunters are still so tangible, yeah. and so there's still nothing like being able to get something in your hand and being able to use it as almost like a, a bit of decoration in the house almost like mm. that's, that's what, what i was going to say it reminds me of art rather than of a magazine like and yeah, if, cool. if people have ever seen art magazines in general like talking about painting magazines or um even yeah like photos of art in general as a magazine there it, it really reminds me of that yeah yeah and 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 the other thing with like with our industry that's, that's different and why it can kind of support print is like my other example would be something like snowboarding, mm. 
where back in the days someone would get a photo yeah they'll get a photo of a trick or something the only way that you could see that was in the latest you know transworld snowboard or something yeah. but now you can just put that photo on instagram and there doesn't need to be a story behind a snowboarding image like that's yeah. just it yeah. and then same with all of the snowboarding videos and whatnot because they're a lot easier to make and everyone's doing them then that's just like another thing that will just be rolling over on the websites and social media mm. meanwhile hunting it's just like you know like you can't you can't just tell you know a full story in in one image yeah. on your Instagram or something. So yeah, so I think also like obviously yeah, we're working on it. It's a very niche market, right? Like it's a space where there's not a, there's there's a, enough people doing it, but it's also a space where people who are doing it are incredibly passionate. So I feel like it yeah. gets supported based on that fact anyway. Like if you're doing a good job, people come and support you. Um, just because yeah. it helps to get the message out about what they're doing and support what they're doing as well. It's not just, it's almost like a, a bigger picture uh, business in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're totally right, man. And like the hunting community is awesome like that. Like if something does pop up, then yeah, you do want to support it because you do want to see hunting, hun anything hunting related be successful because mm. then, you know, yeah, because you want to see a, on shelves you want to see it you know in in your everyday life um and so and, and that's what we've had as well like people people love the magazine they love the content and they also just love supporting something hunting <laughs> yeah and so, so where do you yeah. get a lot of your content from do you get people just to write in for you or do you like to actually go and interview people instead well well that's that's probably like our, our biggest quality is the fact that we go out and shoot hunts like photograph and tail hunts with the seasons and so i might be documenting a hunt a week before it goes to print mm. and so we'll quickly put it together and, and get it in the magazine um so and so that's different to other magazines where yeah they just get people to um to submit stuff and they kind of take anything like yeah. someone will go on a hunt and they'll take photos on the iPhone and they'll be like, yeah, that's good. We'll chuck it in. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we have to turn down a lot of stories because we're trying to keep the, uh, um, the quality of the magazine consistent. Yeah. And so like I, the first couple of issues, like probably 80% of the content was shot by me pho yeah. photographed and then I'd get the hunters to do the writing. But since we've started out, we've seen a lot more people um, get into the photography side. Yeah. And so now I'm probably shooting 30% of the magazine, which is yeah. fucking epic. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah it's so quite crazy. Like everyone is more people just getting into it. Yeah, everyone is definitely becoming a bit more of a photographer in the wild as well. Like, I think it's that realization yeah. that we are in an up close personal with the animals. It's like, why not capture that moment as well? Like a little bit more detail. Um, like even, even I think some of the, the photographers from around the world, I feel like they would really appreciate what bow hunters do meaning animal photographers i feel like they would appreciate what bow hunters do and the experiences that we get because it would be so relatable yeah yeah and but but the other side of that is a lot of that wildlife photography that you see like those beautiful nat geo images and whatnot a lot of them are taken in say like game parks or mm, or yeah or or reserves and whatnot meanwhile we're genuinely getting in on wild animals yeah you know so like I could I could go into a high fence estate in New Zealand and it's a piece of piss to get up close to those animals and get the most beautiful shots um, day in, day out, you know. Yeah. But when it comes to wild animals that, that we're trying to hunt, it's a whole other ball game. So I don't think they do totally appreciate it yeah. when you do get a clean shot of an animal. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, dude, we are. We got gifted a holiday to the Philippines to a, a dive resort, and so um, this is based on my other podcast I run for my business. We actually, the guy had been listening to our podcast for ages. He's like, "Hey, I really love what you guys do. I really appreciate everything you uh, like. You've helped me a lot. I really appreciate that. If you ever want to have a holiday in the Philippines, let me know." So we hit him up. We're like, yeah, of course. We're like, why would you not take that? Um, and so it was this yeah. cool dive resort. I went over and ended up doing my, um, my diver certificate with them and stuff. But while we were there, they literally had like parties of probably 18. There was one party of like 18, one party of 24 people that were all just like photographers for scuba diving. Like that's all they wanted to do. 
and their gear and their get up was so ridiculous. Like the amount of money these people had spent into it. And a lot of them were just hobbyists. Like it was just for the sake that they really enjoyed getting in the water and seeing that up close and personal. And it kind of, like in a sense, it kind of re reminded me of hunting in a sense, because essentially they're going out, they're trying to find these animals. Like it's a lot easier than that form because I saw everything they saw and it was the first time I've been down there. But yeah. within saying that, these guys had come from like America, from, uh, from Europe, just to come to this one location because they knew it was going to be so good for um, the snakes. I don't even remember what they are, the black and white striped ones that are bulk and like really venomous. But um, like getting to see that shit is really cool and getting to see it up close and personal. And when you see it like that, I think it's kind of like, oh, like I could almost relate to them straight away based on that. Apart from it was a lot easier than the stuff we do with the bow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's epic. Have you seen um, Sam Wild stuff? No. Have you heard of the name Sam Wild? I have heard of him. He's but... um, well, well, he he does uh all the underwater um camera work for a spear fishing show that's coming out soon. Ah, cool. In New Zealand, and he is just a an insane underwater photographer. Um, and some of the shit that he that he used to do is just is just mind blowing because. We, we did a big film premiere here um, uh, about a month ago. And um, and so we screened a, an episode from South Sea Sparrows where they're, mm. um, where they're trying to shoot Marlin yep. at the Wanganato Escape. So it's directly halfway between us. And, um, and yeah, like the, the stuff that he used to go through, like, you know, although he can kind of jump into a boat afterwards, it's just the most physical looking thing to film like he's he's trying to swim behind these guys that are hanging on to marlin and whatnot but yeah he's he's definitely someone's work that you should check out because I, cool. I don't Just, do any spear fishing myself i don't i don't even like the water but yeah. i loved watching the spear fishing eh? yeah i just uh, i just liked him his page is sick like on instagram um it, that's kind of interesting right like i think a lot of people don't understand that with a fish when you're spear fishing they're gonna run once you like they swim off once you hit them and something like a marlin that drags you dude like they'll take you for a spin yeah yeah exactly and so he's just trying to pedal behind them you know so he'd be to, just uh, he wouldn't have like obviously the tank or anything on right he'd just be no nah. and, and it, maybe... nah, it's a, yeah it's all free diving yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's, very it's all free diving for those guys yeah. yeah 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 totally um and it's it's so impressive because i got to see some of what they did in, in fjordland when we were here on sort of like a hunting and diving trip for the hunters club mm. and so i was just filming but those guys were diving down to 25 30 meters and they'll hang out down there for like a minute minute and a half and oh it's just it's such wild stuff eh? so impressive yeah. eh? i actually just heard a, a really good podcast with um do you know kimmy werner She's the nope. a chick from yeah, she's a chick from Hawaii who's like one of the, the top female um spearfisher ladies. And she just yeah, she like hearing this podcast is so cool and just hearing how long they can hold their breath for and stuff. And she did this course once. She's she said she never really tries to um actually hold her breath for as long as she can, but she did this course and did it for four and a half minutes, like just she was just holding underwater just normally and then came up anyway. Like, holy crap, like I don't know. I do, I do a lot of breathing stuff for fitness and teach a lot of breathing stuff for fitness. But like even, even once you've got your blood like well oxygenated to hold your breath for longer than say two minutes is incredibly tough. And that's with doing exercise beforehand. Yeah. Like, that's rough. <laughs> that's, yeah, that stuff's insane. Eh? Yeah. yeah, super yeah. cool. I'd, I'd love to get into spearfishing. It's definitely something I'd love to get into. Um, I got a mate whose dad actually holds the record, I think, for blackfin tuna in the south, in the southern hemisphere. Um, yeah, he right. told me the story once. It was like he, he shot it, it dragged him for a kilometer, and the rules are you have to get your own gun. So he had to somehow get it back up to the boat um, to, to get his next gun out. And so he got that and went shot it again. Like it's just this epic story. I can't quite remember it, and I've really butchered it now. But it was, it was like impressive, <laughs> like that, like ridiculous what he had to go through. Wow! Wow! Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's it's definitely cool stuff, and it's getting a lot more popular. But yeah, definitely. But, yeah. So for you, it's fun, like, guys. for you, like the hunting side of things, um, obviously within your own hunting, but more so around with the filming side of things. Is there animals that you'd really love to go out and be able to hunt with the camera as such, like watching either filming other people bow hunting or just getting amongst in general? 
Um, I, if we're talking about it, like, I think it's different if we're talking about animals, um, compared to getting a particular image that I want. Like there's some images that I just dream of getting with just what we've got here in New Zealand. Like mm. that would be amazing for me. Um, but like, I'm really interested in, in traveling overseas and, and seeing how people hunt and what they hunt. Like, yeah. I love that but I just don't get a lot of the time now to travel overseas because, you know, you're looking at two and a half, three weeks for, mm. for a lot of those trips. So the opportunities are there, but Canada's probably just right up there for me. Eh? I'd love to photograph a, a sheep hunt over there. Yeah. That would be, yeah, that would be one of my, my goals. Because I would have said Ibex, but I've already done that with Pedro. Yeah. And so that lived up to its expectation. Like that was just insane. How, how long, like, give us a little rundown on that hunt because you said two and a half weeks or whatever as an experience. Like, how long did it take? What did you guys have to go through to even get to where you were hunting? Yeah, well, he, um, that, that trip was quite unfortunate because, so it was, it was maybe like two and a half, three days of travel to get there, to, yeah. to get to Mongolia. Um, and so eventually we got there um, and then he got, tonsillitis i think it was on, on the first day yeah and so he was just crook for probably like six days straight and so i and and so the hunt was 10 days total um maybe it was six for six or seven days and so i still went out while he had to stay in the yurt every day like he just stayed in bed sweating yep. and, and crook as but i still went out with the guides and so we were still going out we were trying to track down like a good belly for him and and whatnot, but I think what that also did was it started to spook the animals and yeah. get them moving out of the area because by, by the time it came for, for Pedro to, to come out for a hunt um, on like the, the seventh or eighth day, there, we weren't seeing nearly as many animals as what we were on the first couple of days. Mm -hmm. And so we got right in close to, to a billy. Um, I think it might have been around the 30 meter mark that, that we were in on the mob. And, um, and it was just, it was insane country, man. And like, it's, it felt gnarlier than what we've got here in New Zealand wow. in terms of like when you're, you know, climbing through bluffs and whatnot. But the difference is the rocks aren't going to give out on you like the, the shit that we've got here. So, yeah, okay. so we're, we're climbing across almost vertical stuff, but you've got plenty of footholds and handholds. So you feel really safe. Yeah. Meanwhile here, if you're on the same sort of vertical, like you're shitting yourself because you know, rock might just fall out and you're going to slip off something. But, um, but yeah, so, so we got into that Billy, but he made the call that it was too young for him. Mm. And a lot of us were like, Oh, damn it. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we, we would have loved if he had it yeah. because that ended up by being our last opportunity for that trip. Yeah. And so, and so the trip came to an end and we didn't get another opportunity on a, on a Billy, the, the whole, the whole, the whole time and so we both flew out and he offered for me to go back with him mm. but in total that was like just over two weeks away from home for me and i was like fuck it. like i just don't think i can do that again yeah so he flew back by himself with his camera and i think on the third day he managed to nail a, a giant a giant billy with a bow wow. so yeah, that was epic for him, and I wish I was there because I might have only been away from home for like seven days. <laughs> yeah. so, of course, it would have so, worked out if you yeah. did it that way. Yeah, 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 exactly. If I was there, then we would have been over there for another two weeks or something. What um, what sort of response does he give to the end of a trip like that? Like, obviously, he was sick and then went out for it and uh, it was didn't find the billy he wanted as such what's his sort of outlook on a trip like that? Like, is that a failed trip? Is that, was that, was he upset? Was he angry? Like how, how was like someone of his caliber taking that trip? Well, well, obviously he was upset because it was like a dream hunt of his. Mm. Um, and, and there's also the, like, because I was there filming for Kuyu. And so there's also the pressure of him investing money into doing this because he has to get content for, for yeah. Kuyu and, yeah. and all that. But for him personally doing his hunting, like he, he doesn't so much target um, species 
he more targets destinations. And yeah, so, okay. so he just loves he, he just loves going to new places, exploring new countries, you know, new people. Yeah. And so for him, like he still loves it because he got to go to Mongolia and and hang out with some nomads for, for ten days. So he That's was cool. happy, but obviously when you look forward to a trip that much and you have to send a year for six days then you're pretty gutted. <laughs> a bit different, yeah, definitely. But, I've actually connected yeah, with him I, a little bit. We've been in talks, but um, we just haven't been able to tee up a, a time to talk yet. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that comes to fruition. Yeah, yeah he's um, yeah, he, he's such a good fella, right? Eh? How long? Um, Pedro. So. How, how was the language barrier between you both? <laughs> it was funny, yeah. It was, it was real funny because he's, um, like, his English is fine, but he more struggled to understand me. Yeah, okay. And so, like, even some of our messages now, like, I'm just laughing because he doesn't know what I'm talking about. Or, <laughs> or often I don't understand the gibberish that, that he's on about. And then we're also throwing in the mix all of these Mongolian nomads yeah. and only one speaks English, rough <laughs> English. So the yeah. three of us, they were just all battling to understand each other. But, but yeah, it was cool with the, um, with the, with the Mongolian nomads there none of them spoke a word of english but like at night i'd still go hang out in the yurt while they're all sitting around watching the insides of an ibex boil and would kind of just hang out there and they they were definitely taking the piss out of me or something but like we kind of didn't need to speak the same language like yeah we could kind of just sit there and they could make fun of me and you know i'll, I'll laugh and have a good time one thing that I found out on that trip was, like, I think penis jokes are universal. <laughs> because, like, you know, like, we, I, I made a few of those jokes with the Mongolians and they were making them back, you know, they'd, they'd signal it, I don't know, penis jokes or fart jokes or, yeah. you know, and it was... Uh, yeah. Boys will be boys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Boys are, yeah, boys will be boys no matter where the fuck yeah <laughs> no it's very true i think um i've definitely been in a few situations like traveling overseas where you have no idea of the language yet you still have some sort of like you can still connect with people you can still see yeah. what they're doing you can still wave you can still language i guess like body language is still a part of it yeah and and we all understood hunting as well so it's like i i think the only thing with the with the language barrier and going to a country like that to hunt where you we do still need input from the guides on, on how to get these animals is you kind of feel like you've been taken out of the, the tactical side of getting into those animals a wee bit mm. because you can't just directly communicate with them. Like they kind of make up the plan and they try to explain it to you and you're kind of like, okay, sweet. I guess we'll just follow you because if you've got an idea on how to put on a stalk, they don't understand it. Yeah, and so yeah. like, and so like, Pedro, he he have ways that he wants to hunt, but he can't communicate it to them. So yeah. you kind of just have to trust them. But yeah, part of it, I guess. Um, and so yeah, I mean, exactly. transitioning from from the filming side of things, actually turning into your your own go hunting experience. Like, what's what's kind of plans? What's your first point of call or first animal you want to go after? I don't, I don't know. I almost like anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like that. You know, I I don't want to start off on goats because I quite like goats. I don't want to kill them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, so like, so so the two times I've been out the bow, like I've got in within like about thirty meters of of some red hinds. Those are the only animals that that I've stalked in on, and um. For one reason or the other, like just one of them, I blew it. I think it was because I wore shorts so they could just see my glowing legs because there was no other reason. Like the wind was perfect. I used some cover and I could just see them feeding through through this bit of scrub. So I was like, sweet, I can just see them, but I don't think they can see me, but I think they saw my glowing legs. <laughs> and, and the other time uh, I stalked in on a hind and I was in the fog and then this is where like the real inexperience of, of, of being that close to animals kicked in it was like, I couldn't range it. And so I probably got within 15 meters of this time, but I couldn't tell if it was like 15 meters or 25 meters. Yeah. 
And then she, and she just had her ass facing me looking over her back. And so there wasn't like an ethical shot. Yeah. And so she moved off and she might've been at around 30 meters, 35 meters. And my range finder wouldn't work. And so I just, I just didn't, I just didn't have a clue yeah. where I'd put my pin. So I didn't want to take the shot. Meanwhile, an experienced bow hunter in that situation would have, you know, would have on, yeah. down, you know? Yeah. like they would have known that distance or they would be able to gauge it themselves. But, um, that's something I battled with this rut as well. Like quick, quick response and knowing what it is like with that dead space between you, like at home, I know what 20, 30 and 40 meters looks like because it's a straight, straight path. There's no trees or anything in between any, there's no dips and hills or yeah. whatever. And so it's like, when you get into that situation, your depth perception changes so much. Um, yeah. And trying to be able to get that. It, it, yeah. Especially in a fast amount of time, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so I think I'm going to have to blow a few more stalks before, you know, obviously before I start to get a, a hang of it. Um, but yeah, like the next trip will probably with, be with Monty as soon as this lockdown's done. Um, I really, I really want to chase some um, some tar with it, just because they're they're quite a they're not a dumb animal, but they're not that onto it. It's just their eyesight, yeah. And and it's it's just the eyesight and the country that you've got to deal with. But meanwhile, they're probably like the easiest animal to get in close to. What about pigs? Do you guys have many pigs where you are? Oh yeah, we've got, we've got heaps of pigs. I just don't know. I just don't have access to any Places. private land, which is where they're generally found. Like, yeah, okay. It's pretty hard to find public land here and go out and target a pig. Yeah, yeah, true. You know, but um, but I've seen heaps of Nick Morden stuff, and fuck, it looks like fun, eh? Looks yeah, like definitely. Fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The people we've got access to, they they seem to like they're very. They're not even seasonal. They just come and go as they please. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, have one. <laughs> We, we sat on the, they come in and they feed on the, the cow's grain. And so we sat on the roof and waited for them to come in one night. And um, yeah. my auntie was standing behind me. She is shining the torch. Like she, we weren't shining the torch until it came in nice and close. So I'm sitting on this mattress with my legs kind of hanging off the side, sitting straight legged, trying to take my shot. And I, I pulled to full draw and I hadn't tried pulling to full draw yet. Um, like at full reach i'm like banging it on the edge of the mattress like it's bouncing up and down um and it's completely dark like trying to see just was not working at all and she's like do i, do I turn on the light yeah turn it on turn it on and she turned on we had like this red light on and it pretty much turned on the pig kind of startled i went to take my shot and bounce and hit it anyway and just shot off because i used a trigger shot i'm like fuck's sake <laughs> just lost my arrow like it was just completely pointless i'm like sorry we waited we waited for an hour but nothing happened, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> no, that sounds pretty entertaining, though. Yeah. Um, was... Yeah. That I um, yeah. I, I really, really want to get back over to Oz because I did a buffalo hunt up there um, last year with with Blood Origins. I was just filming, um, but then he he surprised me and let me shoot a, a buffalo with with a rifle. Mm. But um, I'd love to go back there and try hunt them with the bow. Like, yeah. Yeah, if I were to go back, then I'd definitely want to try to take the bow. But um, yeah, and then we're talking to, to Kimmy and Adam as well about some hunts that Khan and I can go over and, and do and and whatnot. But yeah, it's endless. Yeah, that's awesome, yeah. man. I think that's the thing. Like when I first got into bow hunting, I really thought of it as a, it has to happen now. Like it has to be now. And then I realized like people do maybe two to three hunts in a year and that's kind of their year. Like that's their season yeah. down or whatever. And it's like, as it's spread out and as I've, as I've gotten deeper into it, I've started to realize like, no, it's, it's like from here on out, this is now like, it, now that I've adopted bow hunting, it's something that I do want to continue to do. It's something I want to share with my, with my daughter when she gets older. And, um, it's like, I don't know, just that stuff in general, you like, you start to realize like, this is a bit more of a way of life now rather than just yeah. a quick hobby that's around for a year or so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I'm struggling with that at the moment now that I've got it because, um, because now when I go, so it's the before, before Kim and Adam had sent me that bow, like I knew I wanted to get into it. Mm. And so before that, um, it didn't matter if I was on a, on a bow hunt or a rifle hunt, I, I didn't have any desire to, to shoot the animals myself. Yeah. Like I never felt like I was missing out. Like I just happily take photographs of people, you know, taking good animals. But since I've gotten this bow, I've taken it on, on two um, photography trips where I'm supposed to be photographing and filming 
And fuck, honestly, the whole time I'm just like, I do not want to be filming. I do not want to be filming. <laughs> but I want to be. I, I, I want to have the bow, and I've never felt that before. Never yeah. ever felt that before. So yeah. it's just like a, yeah. So I'm definitely feeling that urgency, like you know, I just want to Bitten by the keep bug. hunting, want to keep going at the bow. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like, and I've just never felt that with rifle hunting. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's cool. I think um, I think it kind of speaks volumes for what bow hunting is, right? Like, I think something I get a lot is people reaching out because of the podcast, and they might be rifle hunters, and they're like, "Hey, I've, I've transitioned to bow hunting now because of your podcast. Thank you so much." And that to yeah, me, like, that's cool. that's massive. That's kind of like what keeps me doing the podcast realistically. Um, that's cool. Like getting those little reach outs. That's that's the things that you're like, "Fuck yeah!" Like this is actually worthwhile. Like as much as a pain as it can be at times it's so it's so rewarding when you get a message like that yeah yeah and yeah that's that's awesome and and bow like that's what i've found with with the bow hunters that i've spent time with is every single one of them just loves to share about it you mm-hmm. know like they, they they love to get other people or encourage other people to get into it yeah so yeah it's 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 a real helpful community bow hunters. yeah definitely Definitely. Maybe it's because they all know that if you're getting into bow hunting, you can have a, you, yeah, you can have a wee time learning how to do it, and you're probably not going to be that successful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's, like let's watch this guy scramble for a few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really exactly it. They're like, yeah, I'll, I'll help you get a bow set up and start shooting it, but fuck, you're gonna you're gonna mess a lot up. So it's, it's kind of like a test, right? Like I think the people that stick in it for longer than a year, you, you're pretty much like, oh yeah, they're probably a good person. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. And um and you know, the amount that people practice with it and yeah and give it a go. Cause like, I, I don't ever want to um be like the kind of person because you see it a wee bit with bow hunters where they feel a little more elite than rifle hunters. Yeah, yeah. And and I can kind of understand that because to be honest, it is hunt uh it is a lot harder in almost every aspect. Mm. But um I'll I'll always be happy to to pick up a rifle one day probably i i don't know actually because i'm enjoying bow hunting that much but 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 you know like um yeah like i'll, I'll still want to pick up the rifle on on future hunts but right now it's definitely definitely okay. taking over yeah <laughs> yeah I, i'm i'm definitely interested in getting my gun license eventually um and doing that side of things as well like whenever it needs to be a quick meat trip then that's what it would be is probably yeah, rifle cool. because I don't know. I've been I've been out that many times and not had much success with the with the bow. That's for sure. Like just had so many failed failed stalks. I think is the better way to say it. Like you get closer, you get personal with the, with the animals, but um, yeah, it, it's like it's return on meat has not been great. So I feel like <laughs> it, yeah, if it was a quick trip or even to take the rifle to get food and then from there go out and do the hunting side of things. Or yeah, I think if it was like a one or a two day trip then it makes a lot more sense to maybe go with the rifle. But if you're getting out for three, four, five days, then that's when it should be kind of like bow, bow territory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I do admire the, the bow hunters that, that just stick with the bow. Like, mm, yeah. They, you know, like it's, it's either the bow or, or nothing for them. That's, and that's fucking cool as well. <laughs> yeah. I think because I haven't really experienced the other side of it. Like I grew up on a farm and we did a little bit of rabbit hunting when I was younger. But I would definitely... I feel like I would prefer to do the bow. And that's the reason why I'm not going and getting my gun license straight away. Like I want to make sure that I've got animals down with the bow properly before I go and transfer. I don't want to be that person that's like, oh yeah, I'll get the rifle and then never go back to it. So I'm like yeah. going to set this goal to make sure I get a red deer down at least with the bow before I yeah. try to do anything with the rifle, if even. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I always went to the bow because it was more accessible here in Australia. Like you have to go and do a different... Um, I'm sure it's probably the same in New Zealand. You had to get like licenses and stuff like that for the for the gun. Yeah. Whereas um, for the bow, you don't. You just get it and you're good to go. So yeah. it's kind of like, hey, I've, I've got nothing that I need to do before I go hunting apart from have a bow and buy some arrows. And yes, it's expensive, but it, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've been loving it as well, being able to just shoot the bow at home. Like we've got a bit of land here. So yeah. So I can practice yeah, as, as much as I want. And, um, and like, yeah, getting a getting a gun license here is pretty pretty fucking easy yeah. but it's just it's still a lot easier to to just start practicing with the bow and mm-hmm. and I, i'd love if i had a rifle range here and i could shoot the rifle whenever i wanted but yeah. you can't so mm-hmm. it's, it's cool having the bow for that um but i've been watching um uh 
What's his name? Oh, he's, he, he shoots for Matthews. He's more of a competition shooter. Does a lot of hunting. Levi? Uh, yeah, Le- yeah, Levi Morgan, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been watching his two latest um, uh, clips on, on uh, Target Panic and whatnot. Yeah, okay. I haven't seen and I've, I've, it. I've found him so helpful. Like, because yeah. it's nothing beats having some of my um, more experienced bow hunting friends come around and, and shoot with me and show me. And so, and they got me started and understanding how it all works. But um, being at home, being able to watch his videos, it gets me pumped up to go shoot the bow because what he's explaining makes so much sense. Yeah, that's cool. Because um, obviously when someone's teaching you something, and, and it's same when I'm trying to teach someone about cameras, like there's so much to explain that yeah. you forget a lot of the details that would be yeah. really helpful to someone. So, so someone's gone through and they've jotted down like, you know, the main points to teach. And so you can watch it you can shoot and then the next day you can pull up the clip again and then yeah. rejog your memory of, of what you're trying to do. And so I've found him real helpful, you know, around the tag, you know, yeah, that's cool. I'll have to check that. And I mean, like, obviously he's going to be pretty good with that stuff considering he's been world champion for, I think a few years now, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's a lot, won a lot of champions, uh, a lot of championships, but um, yeah, really? just the way that he explains it and everything. I don't know if you saw recently be, um, he went on a hunt and they were cutting up an animal and he knifed himself. He like literally put his knife through his, I think it was through his calf or through his quad. And they had to oh, get, shit. yeah, he had to get like um, ambulance out. It's pretty crazy. I saw a lot of it on his story. I was just like, what the heck? Yeah. Oh, no shit. Yeah. I've, I've only just started following him in the last maybe two weeks since he released that video and someone tagged me. So I haven't seen a lot of his hunting side. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. I think that was, it would have been their elk season. So what's that like August maybe? Um, September, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was like, yeah, it was crazy. Proof of one. Well, dude, um, <laughs> I, think, I think that's probably a good place to wrap. Like, I think realistically, people can get across, follow you is a good place to start. So, the Hunter's Journal on Instagram, uh, jump across to the hunter'sjournal.co.nz as well is another place to, to get along and um, check out the stuff you're doing. But I would say go ahead and cross, go ahead and watch the um, the wildfire film. I think that's really cool. The thirty cool, minute film you guys have put up. I think that's a great place to start. Is there anywhere else where people should check it out? Um, now, pretty much just check out the website, YouTube. We don't have a lot on YouTube at the moment. That's mm-hmm. we'll do some more of that. Building. And and also, if people have got questions about cameras and shit, just just flick us a message. Yeah, sick. No, that's awesome. Thanks for joining me, bro. Yeah, thank you, man. Appreciate it.